Each week we're going to hear different versions of those Beatitudes each Sunday that uh, we look at each one. And you'll see how rich different translations are. And Jesus, when he shares those Beatitudes, is sharing it in a very memorable form so that his teaching would stay with us. And I believe it would be good for us all to learn one version off by heart. And I encourage you to learn the whole of the Beatitudes uh, by heart so that we're there. But we don't only want to learn it in our heads. I believe that God wants us to learn heart deep and for this really to change our lives, to change our church and then to change the world in which we live. The first beatitude, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Just two other versions, happy are those who know their need of God. One other, blessed are those who know they are spiritually poor and bankrupt and impoverished. They are in the right place. This verse means that when we know we're in need of God, then we are truly blessed. But on the other hand, when we are self-satisfied and full of our own goodness, we really are in trouble. Bishop Croft uh, writes in that book that I referred to, a tough critique of the church in the 21st century. He writes this, Despite all the problems we face and despite progress in many areas, the church in Britain does, still does not seem to me at the moment to know in a very deep way that we are poor in spirit and in need of God's grace. We more easily, I think, convey an impression carried over from previous generations that we are rich, that we have prospered and that we need nothing. There are, of course, exceptions to this, but in general terms, to visit many meetings, you would not think that we know that we are spiritually poor or dependent in every moment on God's grace. The burden of our history has inflated our sense of self-importance and self-dependency. We think we can get by without God. That's a pretty hard thing to say about the church, but for five years, every Sunday, he was visiting different churches, and he's a shrewd person. He grieved, for example, over the fact that our society, there's huge spiritual appetite, but on the other hand, he recognized that very few people saw that it was the church that was going to satisfy their spiritual needs. Why? He felt because of the church's own poor spiritual state. And so he draws to a conclusion in this chapter where he says, My dream and vision for the church in Britain 20 years' time, better still in two years' time, or even the day after, tomorrow is this. It is that we would know our spiritual poverty. I have longed for us to become more like the tax collector, knowing our need than the Pharisee we re resemble at present, full of our own achievements and self-sufficiency in relation to God. I hope that this might be reflected in our prayer lives, in our meetings, our planning, in our attitudes to those around us, and that we would be known as a church that is humble before God and not one that is self-sufficient. So how do we respond? I believe we respond according to the epistle in three different ways. First, we're called to repent. Second, we're called to faith. And thirdly, that we're called to commitment, radical commitment of radical discipleship to the radical Jesus. Well, first, uh, in the book of Revelation, it says this, to those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline, so be earnest and repent. We're called to repent. I believe we're called to repent on behalf of the nation, like the prophets of old, like Nehemiah. I think we repent for the worlds of finance, business and industry, where decisions 
um, profit some and impoverish many. I think it was absolutely wrong what happened at MG, where profit has been made uh, more important than people, where money has been made more important than morality, ownership more important than stewardship, comfort more important than compassion, justice and care for the poor. And I think at St. Peter's, myself, first of all, I need to challenge myself. Are we, like Jesus, good news for the poor? I think there are ways in which we are, and through people's workplace, this is true. But I think there are ways in which we need to go on a longer journey about St. Peter's being good news to the poor. Secondly, called to faith. Jesus doesn't leave us, as it were, in the gutter. He stands and says with that familiar verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and them with me. Our, ha- our hearts are like houses where each of us is king of the castle and where we rule the roost. But Jesus comes and he knocks on the door. I wonder what you're like when someone knocks on the door. Maybe you've got one of those houses where you can peep out and see who it is. And then you look out and you think, oh, it's my friend who always brings me muffins. Great. And you welcome them in and in they come and you have a lovely time. And it's as though we're looking out through the window and we see Jesus, this friend of sinners. Jesus, this man who's lived the most beautiful life that's ever been lived. Jesus, the one who says that he loves us just the way we are. And he's standing outside the door of the house of our lives. And he's asking, can I come in? I really want you to, I want to share my life with you so that you can live the life to which I've called you. My plan and my destiny for you, my dream for you. Will you let me in? And of course, if we let him in, he, we find that uh, he doesn't want to be left in the front room. He calls us to commitment. He wants to come and take control of our lives, every part of it. He wants to become king of the castle with his flag flag flying uh, from the window of our house. So, blessed are those who know their need of God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's those blessed ones who can say in their own hearts and minds and share together these words. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never mislead me. He'll never forget me. He'll never overlook me. He'll never cancel my appointment in his appointment book. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives. When I'm weak, he is strong. When I'm lost, he is the way. When I'm afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm hurt, he heals me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I'm blind, he leads me. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he's with me. When I face face persecution, he shields me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. He is God. He is faithful. I am his and he is mine. God is control. I am on his side. And that means all is well with my soul. Every day is a blessing because God is. So let's come to God. Let's be changed, transformed to become on this exciting journey through the autumn. To become more like Jesus individually together, like Jesus, who lived in dependence on his Father and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Just leave a moment of quiet as the band come forward. Let's just be still and quiet. And in your own heart, maybe you'd like to make a prayer to God, how you seek, perhaps, to repent to exercise faith that welcoming Jesus in and responding to his longing that our lives will be committed to his wonderful way of living.